Hello, welcome to this training on fair housing in a New York State Homes and Community Renewal Financed Housing. This is current as of December 8th, 2022. Make sure to check back for any updates in our policy guidance. My name is Nadia Salcedo. I'm the director of the Fair and Equitable Housing Office, and I am joined by my colleagues who will go through the presentation. Let's take care of some first items, if you can advance. Again, this uh, presentation is for informational purposes only. It isn't legal advice. You have to um, uh, consult with your attorney to obtain any specific legal advice on the issues discussed here. We hope that it is helpful to you and to your organizations and are available as a resource for any questions that come up. So the main topics that my colleagues will go through is one, uh, Fair Housing 101, right? A basic overview on the fair housing laws, a little bit on the history. We'll also go into some special topics about fair housing laws in New York particularly, right? New York State. And then we'll focus on disabilities and reasonable accommodations, which is the main area of fair housing law practice. Uh, go over affirmatively furthering fair housing and how that is embedded in federal and state laws. And then we'll dive deeper into special topics in HCR specific funded housing, right? So that's state funded housing. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Stephen. Thanks, Nadia. Um, so I'm going to get started here with just a general overview of the fair housing laws that, that apply in New York State. Um, so the Federal Fair Housing Act, the FHA, um, the New York State Human Rights Law, which will be called the HRL, and local fair housing laws from cities or counties uh, protect individuals from discrimination in housing based on the protected classes under these laws. These laws aim to promote equal opportunity and prohibit discriminatory practices that unfairly limit the housing choices of protected groups or individuals. Um, so you'll notice that in that previous slide, we used that phrase protected class. And basically what that means is that under these uh, fair housing laws, it is prohibited to discriminate against someone because of their membership in one of these categories. So, for example, under the Fair Housing Act, which is federal and applies across the country, you can't discriminate in housing because of someone's race, color, religion, familial status, national origin, disability, or sex. The New York State Human Rights Law, which applies to all housing in New York State, uh, goes a little bit further, and it prohibits discrimination on some additional categories that you can see there, like creed, age, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, marital status, military status, lawful source of income, certain justice involvement records, and domestic violence victim status. One final thing we'd like to note is that depending on where you are in New York State, um, some additional categories might apply under local fair housing laws. So, for example, veteran status is a protected class in New York City and Suffolk County and also citizenship or immigration status and lawful occupation are protected categories in the New York City Human Rights Law. Uh, so let's take a step back and look at some of the historical context. Why were these laws passed in the first place? Um, so for most of American history, uh, segregation and housing discrimination were not only, uh, you know, a common practice, but they were explicitly condoned by the law. So in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, the Supreme Court upheld uh, segregation under the so-called separate but equal doctrine, and that remained the law of the land until it was eventually overturned by Brown v. Board of Ed in 1954. Um, we can see here listed sort of many different ways that housing uh, discrimination uh, occurred both in practice and under the law, the racially restrictive covenants, segregation in housing and, and suburban uh, developments. One thing we would like to, to note though is uh, you see that practice of redlining. This wasn't just a practice that was engaged in by private landlords or uh, real estate agents. 
Also, the federal government explicitly denied loans and insurance to people of color or in certain areas with, with high uh, populations of people of color. Uh, eventually, by the 60s, of course, there was the, the Civil Rights Movement, and that sort of culminated with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which covered uh, prohibited discrimination on employment and federally funded programs, but it did not yet cover housing. This is just a, a quick visualization of the practice of redlining. As you can see, the federal government uh, went drew explicit maps of areas of with high cup communities of, of color, and they would refuse to offer mortgages or insurance in those areas. So ultimately, the uh, Federal Fair Housing Act was passed and signed in 1968. Uh, the law, as it was written, had two goals. The first is the basic goal of ending discrimination in housing. The second one, which we'll talk about a little bit later on in this presentation, is the duty to affirmatively further fair housing or AFFH. Uh, one quick thing to note is that the original law did not include protections for disability. That was only added to the law 20 years later uh, in 1988. So moving to the uh, New York State human rights law, uh, in 1945, the law was passed and New York State became the first state in the country to prohibit employment discrimination. Uh, and then in the 1950s, uh, the law was amended to include protections for housing discrimination. Um, and so uh, we just want to cover again, we've discussed this on a previous slide, these additional categories that in many ways the state human rights law goes further than the Federal Fair Housing Act. So these all apply to all housing in New York State, whether it's uh, privately owned or publicly funded, all these additional categories on top of the, the Federal Fair Housing Act categories. Um, so here's just a quick slide we like to include, uh, you know, who must comply with fair housing laws? And the short answer is everybody. Um, it's, it does, it's not just landlords or real estate agents. It's also uh, government agencies, banks issuing mortgages, uh, building staff, anyone who's involved in housing must comply with these fair housing laws. Uh, so we've discussed sort of what, you know, who is covered by these laws and what these protected classes are. Um, but let's take a quick look at what is actually pro prohibited conduct under the fair housing laws. So the first bullet point is what you might think of as sort of the most clear cut case of uh, housing discrimination. And this is the refusal to rent or sell housing to someone because of their membership in one of those protected classes. However, it also goes a little bit broader, so you can't make false representations about housing or guide people towards certain areas because of their protected classes. That's called steering. Um, it also, as we said before, applies to banks, so it would also cover the issuing a loan or a mortgage or maybe issuing a mortgage on different terms because of someone's uh, protected characteristic. And also it applies to advertisements for housing. Um, so, for example, uh, while there are some cutouts for some kinds of senior housing, you can't just say no children uh, in, in an advertisement for, uh, for, for housing because familial status is a protected class under the Fair Housing Act and the other laws. Uh, again, quickly, this is something that we will cover a little more detail later on in this presentation, but there are accessibility requirements for people with disabilities. So it is prohibited to design housing that does not comply with the accessibility requirements laid out in both state and federal law. Also, housing providers must make reasonable accommodations and reasonable modifications when necessary. Again, we'll cover all of that in more detail later on in this presentation. So um, one thing we want to flag without getting sort of too far into the, the legal weeds here is there are two kinds of violations that can be that can be the basis of a claim under these fair housing laws. So the first kind is disparate treatment. And this can be sort of, again, what you would think of as the most overt kind of discrimination, refusing point blank to rent someone a house because of their race or religion or sex or familial status. But it can also be a little more subtle like that. So it could just be two, treating two different people or two, two different households differently because of their status in a protected class. 
So the examples we have here is a real estate agent only shows a Muslim couple homes near a mosque, or uh, you require higher security deposits for ch persons with children. Again, familial status is a protected characteristic that would constitute disparate treatment. The second category is called disparate impact, and this is a policy either from a housing provider or local government that is maybe on its face neutral, but it would have a disproportionate adverse effect on a protected class. So the examples are housing provider has a no criminal record policy in its tenant selection. There are certain zoning, restrictive zoning uh, policies on housing developments or a local preference in tenant selection. These all don't explicitly mention any protected class, but as we know, maybe if you look at the demographics within a certain area, the local preference would clearly favor one population over another. So that could create a disproportionate uh, discriminatory impact. Um, all right, just one more uh, general point that we would wanna talk about. These are a few of the agencies and groups that would enforce fair housing laws. So the State Division of Human Rights, uh, DHR, is tasked with enforcing the New York State Human Rights Law. So if someone in New York State is believes they have been the victim of housing discrimination, they can file a complaint with DHR. Um, HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, fills the same role on the federal law uh, enforcing the Fair Housing Act. There are also local groups and organizations. There's the New York City Commission on Human Rights and also their private litigants and attorneys, as well as nonprofit organizations to help uh, people who have uh, suffered from housing discrimination. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Janae, for the next section. Thank you, Stephen. I'm Janae, and I'm going to talk about some special topics in New York Fair Housing Law. Um, first, I'm going to talk about some of the newest protected classes under the New York State Human Rights Law. Stephen had discussed um, some of them earlier, but I'm going to go a bit into more depth. And then I'm going to briefly go over the sweeping changes under Part M of the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019. So first, turning to the New York State Human Rights Law, <clears throat> in 2019, uh, the New York State Human Rights Law was amended to prohibit housing discrimination on the basis of lawful source of income. This means that housing providers cannot deny applicants because they receive, for example, government assistance or rental subsidy or any other form of non-wage income. And the New York State Human Rights Law actually has a list of what is defined as lawful source of income. Um, and it also goes on to say that anything that is considered a lawful source of income. So, you know, it'd be pertinent to look at that and get a sense of what is listed there. So some easy cases of source of income discrimination would be um, a listing that says no Section 8 or working Section 8 only, a listing that might say no public assistance um, or it must have work income. So I'm just gonna get into a list of potential areas that can be the basis of uh, lawful source of income discrimination. These are very fact, fact specific. Um, I just want to note that this list is not exhaustive, but there's just some common examples. Um, you know, if you come across something that looks a little weird, we do recommend looking at the information on DHR's website um, or even contacting them and, and getting a better sense of um, what's what. Just to go through this list, though, so, uh, for example, landlord refusing to fill out paperwork so the tenant can get Section 8. A landlord denying the applicant um, based on a credit score when 100% of the rent is paid by a voucher or subsidy. A landlord refusing to refusing or deliver repairs based on subsidies. And brokers not showing certain units to prospective tenants because they have vouchers. And you can go through the list, um, you know, on your own time. But there's just some common examples that we have seen of source of income discrimination. So secondly, uh, recently, the New York State Human Rights Law also extended its reach to individuals with a history of justice involvement. And we also have our own policy here at HCR for our state-funded housing, but I'll get into that a bit later. But in terms of just the New York State Human Rights Law, as of July 11th of 2019, um, there's that protection against discrimination in housing on the basis of a tenant or applicant's arrest record. So now it's unlawful to inquire about or deny housing to an applicant based on arrests that resolved in the applicant's favor, 
youthful offender adjudications, pending arrest with a germ in contemplation of dismissal, and sealed conviction. Please note that this applies to all housing in New York State. And finally, in this May of this year, uh, the New York State Human Rights Law was amended to protect victims of domestic violence from discrimination, including in housing. So prior to this, victims of domestic and intimate partner violence were only covered as a protected class under the employment provisions of the New York State Human Rights Law. Um, so now it also includes housing. And now I'm going to just briefly touch on the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019, um, as we affectionately call it HESPA. So Part M um, made some pretty big changes to New York State's rent laws. Uh, it created new rights and protections for prospective and current tenants in rental housing across New York. So I'm going to go through some of the big changes for both prospective tenants and then current tenants. Um, I do want to note that HESPA covers all housing in New York State, not just HCR um, state-funded housing. So in terms of prospective tenants, landlords are now prohibited from rejecting applicants on the basis of past or pending landlord-tenant actions or semi-proceedings. So that means that there's a history of an eviction, they cannot deny an applicant on that basis or if they've been involved in housing court. There are now also limits and fees on charges, including secure deposits, which now cannot exceed one month's rent. For current tenants, some of the changes include limitations on fees and charges, including rent increases, fees for the late payment of rent, and attorney's fees. Landlords must also provide a written receipt of rent payments and are required to mitigate damages if tenants vacate prior to the expiration of the lease term. There is now also a prohibition on retaliatory evictions, and that's made very clear in Part M of HESPA as well. Um, and so that is the end of that section. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dan, who's going to talk about disabilities and reasonable accommodations. Hi, I'm Dan, and I'm going to take us on a high-level walkthrough of disabilities and reasonable accommodations. Next. Uh, so housing discrimination remains a barrier to equal access to housing for many individuals and families, and we often see this in the context of disability. Uh, tenants who experience a disability are often denied a reasonable accommodation that would allow them equal access to housing. What reasonable accommodations do is they eliminate barriers that prevent uh, people with disabilities from fully participating in housing opportunities. In other words, any change in the way things are customarily done that would enable a person with disabilities to enjoy housing opportunities is a reasonable accommodation. A reasonable modification is a structural change made to the existing premises uh, that is occupied or to be occupied by a person with a disability in order to allow them uh, to have full enjoyment of the premises. This can include structural changes to interiors and exteriors of the dwellings, uh, and for both reasonable accommodations and modifications, uh, this would apply to common and public use areas. So common examples of a reasonable uh, modification would be shower grab bars, ramps, lowering or removing cabinets, and widening door frames. Next. So <clears throat> New York State's definition of disability differs substantially uh, from the federal definition under the Federal Fair Housing Act. Uh, the Federal Fair Housing Act defines the term as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of such individual. The standard under the FHA is far more difficult to meet uh, in that it requires a substantial limitation of one or more life activities of the individual. There is no such requirement in the state human rights law. It merely requires having a physical, mental, or medical impairment that prevents the exercise of a normal bodily function or a record of having such an impairment or being regarded as having an impairment. So it's important to note here uh, that although we're highlighting the accessible design requirements, there are also requirements set by Section 504 in the ADA, which we'll see on the next slide, uh, 
but there may also be other federal, state, and local laws that have design requirements that uh, you'll be required to follow. But here, uh, to the extent applicable, a project must be designed and constructed to comply with the design and construction requirements under the New York State Human Rights Law and the Fair Housing Act. Under the two laws, some statutory and regulatory design and construction provisions overlap, uh, but when the project is subject to the requirements of more than one federal, state, or local law, it must comply with the requirements of each law. Now, where these laws differ, the more stringent of the requirements would apply. So, for example, state or local laws may increase accessibility beyond what is required by federal law, but they may not decrease the accessibility required under federal law, and the project would have to be in line with what is required under the height and local law. Next. Section 504 and the ADA also mandate protections for individuals with disabilities and provide additional accessible design requirements. So Section 504 provides that no individual with a disability should, because of their disability, be excluded from the participation uh, in or be denied the benefits of or be subjected to discrimination in any program, service, or activity that receives federal financial assistance from HUD. Section 504 requires that multifamily housing projects with five or more units must have a minimum of 5% of units made accessible for people with mobility impairments and an additional 2% of units made uh, accessible for persons with vision and hearing impairments. Uh, Section 504 also applies to multifamily housing projects uh, that have 15 or more units that undergo substantial alterations. And a substantial alteration is when the cost of the alteration uh, or alterations are 75% or more of the replacement cost of the completed facility. We also have Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which provides that no individual shall be discriminated against on the basis of disability in the enjoyment of any place of public accommodation. This means uh, rental offices and other common areas must be readily accessible to individuals with disabilities. Next. When it comes to making a reasonable accommodation request, a housing provider may not require that the request be made in writing. If an individual is unable to make a request in writing due to a disability, management must find an alternate means of intake for that request. So as a best practice, requests should be accepted when made orally or made by a third party on uh, behalf of a disabled applicant or tenant. It is also important to note that verification for a disability may be provided by any qualified third party professional who has knowledge of the disability. Verification is not limited to a medical professional, and in general, verification of a disability should not be required when the disability is obvious or otherwise the disability is known to management. So there tends to be a common misconception around what the word reasonable means in this context. Uh, it is in fact a term of art that refers to the nature of the requested accommodation. If a housing provider refuses a reasonable accommodation request because it is not reasonable, and by that we mean that it's too costly or that it would fundamentally alter the nature of the provider's operations, then the provider should discuss with the requester whether there is an alternative accommodation that would effectively address these needs and does not impose an undue financial or administrative burden. And whether the resident uh, or housing provider pays for the reasonable accommodation is a fact-specific question. Um, this will depend on the nature and location of the housing. Uh, and the human rights law requires housing providers to provide all tenants with written notice of their right to a reasonable accommodation within 30 days of the beginning of a tenancy. And next, I'm gonna pass it off to, to Stephen. Thank you, Dan. Real quickly, this is Nadia. I wanted to go back into the reasonable accommodation section and just say the high bar for uh, not engaging or not allowing a reasonable accommodation is is very high, right? It's fundamentally alter the nature of the program uh, and the financial burden really has to be high. So it's not an 
easy thing to dismiss and something that the courts and that us as a regulatory agency really want to see engagement with the iterative process to try to um, uh, give the resident equal access to the housing on uh, terms that would make it accessible to them. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thanks, uh, Nadia and Dan. I'm just going to go into the next section about the duty to affirmatively further fair housing. Uh, I mentioned this briefly in one of the earlier slides about um, this AFSH duty. It's included in the Fair Housing Act, and it requires all recipients of HUD funding to take meaningful actions to further the purposes of the Fair Housing Act. Um, so. Under the Obama administration, the HUD issued its first uh, formal regulations providing a clear definition of this AFSH duty. And that says that funding recipients must take meaningful actions in addition to combating the discrimination to overcome historic patterns of se segregation and foster inclusive communities that are free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity based on protected characteristics. Uh, so again, this applies to any states, PHAs, and local governments that receive HUD funding. And as part of the law, they are required to certify that they are complying with this AFSH duty. Um, as of late in uh, last year, 2021, uh, Governor Hochul signed a New York State version of this AFSH law. So this then requires any PHAs and localities and other recipients of funding from New York State uh, to take meaningful action to again overcome patterns of segregation and discrimination, eradicate racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, and reduce disparities in access among these other requirements. So again, that applies to anything, who any one entity who is receiving state funding uh, under this law. All right, um, so that was just a quick section. I'm now going to turn it back to uh, Dan to discuss some of these special topics in state funded housing. Uh, hi, everyone. So first, I'm going to start off by talking about our credit policy. Uh, so our credit policy prohibits recipients of state funding from automatically rejecting applicants with poor credit history. Uh, and instead, applicants are required to be individually assessed and allowed an opportunity to present mitigating information. This will require uh, housing providers to look at an applicant holistically rather than automatically denying based on a poor credit score or a negative credit history. The goal here is to eliminate any disparate impact caused by a standard credit score evaluation. When you're evaluating based on a credit score alone, the landlord would make a determination on whether to accept the tenant, regardless of whether mitigating circumstances exist. Uh, and when you evaluate the results of a policy that solely considers an applicant's credit score, you'll see that it adversely affects many communities in New York, in particular people of color, domestic violence survivors, and individuals with disabilities. Not to mention there is an, overwhelm, an overwhelming population of New Yorkers with medical or student loan debt who would otherwise be penalized for attempting to further their education or for getting sick. Next. Our individualized assessment worksheet breaks the evaluation down into a two-part process. Uh, part one will help to determine whether an applicant can forego the credit background check entirely by meeting different criteria. And if the applicant doesn't satisfy part one, housing providers will move on to part two of the assessment where they will consider mitigating factors and evaluate any circumstances that may have negatively impacted an applicant's credit. Requirements set under the Tenant Protection Act have also, incorpor have also been incorporated into our credit policy. Uh, to start, the housing provider may not review an applicant's landlord tenant court history that is prohibited. The Tenant Protection Act also states that background check and credit check fees may not exceed the true cost of conducting that check, uh, or $20 per application, that's not per person, that's per application, uh, whichever is less. If a landlord charges this fee, 
a prospective tenant is allowed to provide the landlord with a copy of a background check or credit check conducted within the past 30 days, and those fees must be waived. Next. Here you'll see a list of prohibited information that may not be considered during the credit evaluation. Uh, one important piece to highlight here is the part of our policy that deals with outreach a housing provider um, may conduct uh, in regards to previous landlords, neighbors, and uh, others for information or references. Uh, one way to get a landlord reference is that an applicant may provide this information voluntarily, uh, or the housing provider may reach out to a previous landlord without uh, the applicant's permission, for, uh, but only to inquire about material lease violations. If the previous landlord provides information beyond the scope of a material lease violation, it may not be considered in the housing provider's evaluation of the applicant. Uh, and lastly, with the applicant's permission, the housing provider may reach out to a previous, a previous landlord to obtain a written record of rental payment history. Uh, it's important to note that the applicant may not be penalized or their decision viewed unfavorably if they do not uh, consent to reach out to the previous, the previous landlord regarding rental payment history. However, the housing provider may still reach out regarding material lease violations. Next. And now I'm gonna hand this back over to Janae to talk about uh, applicants for the history of justice involvement. Thank you, Dan. So I'm going to go through our justice involvement policy. Um, I just want to highlight that we recently did extensive trainings on this um, through the later part of the summer and early part of the fall of 2022. Um, please check the FIHA website for all of the training materials. We have the slides up there in addition to a recording of the training. So um, turning back to the justice involvement policy, first I'm going to go through a bit of history and then I'm going to go over briefly the justice involvement policy, including all of the recent changes. Um, I just want to note um, off the bat that this policy only applies to New York State HDR funded housing. So while it's a great policy that we hope, um, you know, would be something that would be done statewide, as of now, this just applies to HDR funded housing. So turning towards some history, um, and the discriminatory impact of screening for justice involvement. So we know that nearly a third of all Americans have a criminal record of some sort. And we also know that this population includes a disproportionate number of African-American and Latinx individuals who have been arrested and convicted at significantly higher rates than the rest of the U.S. population. <clears throat> Thus, tenant screening, which prohibits applicants with a history of justice involvement, will also have a disproportionate impact on minority home speakers. So in 2016, HUD actually released guidance which stated that blanket policies against those with criminal records can actually violate the Fair Housing Act and create a, disparate, a discriminatory disparate impact against racial minorities. Next. <clears throat> So turning, into, turning to our policy now, I'm just going to briefly go over some um, high-level high points about our justice involvement assessment policy. So first, um, if there is a screening for background checks, and there is no mandate that there has to be a background check on an applicant, in fact, you can choose not to do that, um, but if you do decide to perform a background check, HDR funded housing providers may only consider prior criminal convictions. So this means prior arrests, pending arrests, or accusations that did not result in a conviction cannot be considered. And as I mentioned, um, you know, as I talked about the New York State Human Rights Law earlier, this actually is in line with some of the recent changes to the New York State Human Rights Law. Additionally, housing providers can only consider convictions that involve physical danger or violence to persons or property or that adversely affect the health, safety, and welfare of other people. Um, currently, applicants with a certificate of good conduct or relief from disabilities that is permanent and applies to housing cannot be rejected based on justice involvement under our policy. Um, even if the applicant does have the certificate of good conduct or relief from disabilities and it's temporary or does not apply to housing, um, that can actually be considered a mitigating factor and something to consider as a reason to accept the applicant into housing. 
Housing providers cannot consider offenses that occurred before an applicant turned 18 years of age. So you're only looking at um, prior criminal convictions that occurred once the applicant was 18 years of age or older, nothing before. Additionally, we now have a look back period. So that would be five years for felonies, one year for release from supervision, and one year for misdemeanors. So you can only consider offenses that fall within that period. If an offense does fall within that period, that is not automatic grounds for rejection, but triggers the need to do individualized assessment to work through and consider all the mitigating factors despite that prior criminal conviction. Of course, if the offense falls outside of the look back period, meaning it occurred before that look back period, you cannot consider that offense at all. Next. So if a background check reveals convictions that can be considered under our policy, the housing provider must still perform an individualized assessment. So that means going through the worksheet, taking into consideration all of the mitigating factors that are um, listed on the worksheet in addition to whatever else the applicant has provided um, on their own accord to serve as a mitigating factor. So there are only two instances where there can be an automatic rejection, which is tied to federal regulations, and that's being um, on a lifetime registrant on a sex offender registry or individuals who are convicted of manufacturing meth in their home. These are the only two automatic rejections. Anything else? There must be individualized assessment. <clears throat> so during the individualized assessment, some things that we um, ask the housing provider to consider are how much time has passed since the applicant's conviction, the applicant's age at the time of conviction, remembering that you cannot consider um, any offenses that occurred before the applicant turned eight, um, before 18 years of age. So only offenses that occurred once the applicant was 18 years or older. Um, also, what must be considered are the seriousness of the offense. Um, as I mentioned before, if they have a certificate of good conduct or relief from disabilities, um, even if it's temporary and does not cover housing, that's considered a mitigating factor. Evidence of rehab and good conduct. And after considering all of these factors, the housing provider can then determine whether the applicant is eligible for housing. So the worksheet guidance um, and other information material is available on our website. The link is there. Um, both the justice involvement policy and the credit policy are available on our website. Um, we strongly suggest that you take a look and read through everything that is on there. And now I'm going to turn it back to Stephen, who is going to go over the violence against women act also known as VAWA. Thanks, Janae. Um, so yeah, the Violence Against Women Act, or VAWA, is a federal law which creates protections for survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, VAWA is intended to encourage survivors, regardless of sex, gender identity, or sexual orientation, who are applicants for or tenants of covered housing programs to report and seek help for violence or abuse committed against them without fear of eviction. And it also means that uh, individuals living in certain subsidized housing uh, cannot be discriminated against on the basis of acts of domestic violence, sexual assault, dating violence, or uh, st stalking committed against them. Uh, additionally, for HCR funded housing, uh, housing providers are required in tenant selection to take account of adverse factors that may directly result from an individual being a victim of a VAWA covered crime. And housing providers must also adopt an emergency transfer plan. Uh, so this uh, table provides a, a list of documents which are required to fully implement HCR's VAWA policy. Uh, these can all be found on the HCR FIHO website. Um, so we would encourage any housing providers or anyone else to uh, look at these and review these in more detail uh, to fully comply with HCR's VAWA policy. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the HCR's Affirmative Fair Housing Marketing Plan, or AFHMP. Um, so under the uh, Fair Housing Act, uh, developers and housing providers are required to promote fair housing uh, in their marketing or outreach to uh, communities and in their tenant selection. Um, and in particular, this kind of marketing uh, 
must encourage applications from households least likely to apply, especially based on the demographics of the area that the, the housing is located. Um, so in New York State, we uh, housing providers who receive state funding uh, can comply with this requirement by completing HCR's uh, Affirmative Fair Housing Marketing Plan, which is reviewed by our office, the Fair and Equitable Housing Office. Um, so basically within this marketing plan, we would review whether projects are in compliance with all of the relevant fair housing laws. So that's the requirements of the Fair Housing Act or the uh, state human rights law, but also those specific requirements of HCR's fair housing policies. So this we would especially check for something like the credit and justice involvement policies that Janae and Dan have just covered. Um, so again, we would look at the demographics and what the market of the marketing area, whether there's any supportive housing or special needs and accessible units, uh, any occupancy preferences uh, for, for this project, and tenant selection procedures and reasonable accommodations. Again, we would review all of these to make sure that this is in compliance with the requirements of the relevant fair housing laws and HCR policy. Uh, next, I'm going to quickly give a rundown of HCR's design uh, guidelines. We just wanted to note that in June 2021, HCR released an updated design guidelines, uh, which were developed to ensure minimum standards of quality, function, and durability for projects financed by the state. Um, significantly, among other provisions, the design guidelines implement new accessibility requirements. And again, we would encourage anyone to look at this, these guidelines, which can be found on HCR's website at that, the link listed here. And finally, I would just want to do a quick overview of uh, HCR's fair housing training requirements. Um, so for any HCR funded pr uh, projects, management and leasing staff are required to receive uh, training on all relevant federal, state, and local fair housing laws. Uh, fair housing, pro or housing providers must instruct their employees and agents on uh, non-discrimination in housing, and all employees and, and agents should also attend workshops on fair housing uh, at least every two years. Um, finally, uh, housing providers should keep uh, their certificates of fair housing training on file for at least five years. And these uh, materials are also going to be submitted as part of the marketing plan review process. All right, so this is our last slide and this is our contact information. We would encourage you to uh, get in touch with us if there are any questions about any of the issues uh, covered in this presentation. And thank you for listening.